everyone. How you doing? Great. Let's just, I just want to just say it's so good to be back. It's, you know, big shout out to Daniel and Shauna because they're just bringing such an amazing energy to this meeting. Anyway, yeah, I know. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you today building on what you just heard. Uh, I absolutely love genomics. Uh, this is about rewriting life, but the way to understand me is really I'm just a giant bio nerd. I love this technology. I love what we're going to do with it, and we're still in the earliest days. I was very fortunate uh, through our, our lockdowns to uh, use my time productively with the futurist Amy Webb to write a book on this technology the, uh, called The Genesis Machine. Uh, I encourage you to check it out because I know at leaving this meeting you're going to remember 2% of everything you've heard over the next few days. So what is synthetic biology? It really is this intersection of life science, writ large, all biology, with computation and automation. We're starting to see the convergence of these, of these circles. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. Another way to look at it is it's biology digitized, and the very sweet spot in the center is synthetic biology. I look at, at biology through the lens of my previous career in computing, and I started to notice that really the, the architectures of the cell and the cell phone really were actually pretty similar. It's components put together into circuits, more complex circuits. Ultimately, you get a computing device. Those computing devices can be networked. It's very similar, except we understand everything about the cell phone. We understand everything about the computing networks. We built it all, whereas with biology, it evolved. There are no notes, no records, and we've had to reverse engineer it to understand it. It's a much more complicated job, but today you can actually talk to most people about biology through this lens of computing. The analogy isn't perfect, but these are just time lapses of cells on the left, bacteria on the right, the human cells. They're really, you can think of them as 3D printers, multi-material, making thousands of different compounds all at once. And the cool thing is, they're the 3D printers that 3D printers want to grow up to become. They can make more 3D printers. Now, the program that runs all this is the genome. Uh, I studied bacteria. The, ba the E. coli genome is shown below. That's basically like you squashed it like a bug and, and looked at it. It's not that much information, only about four and a half megabits of information, which is pretty much just one photo on your phone. The human genome, as you just heard, 3.2 billion bits, a little more complex, a little more, a lot more complex, but it's also tightly packed. It's like twisting an elastic band up and up and up, and you get a really, really dense chromosome. When I first saw the picture of the E. coli genome, though, I saw this because my first computer used this as the memory device. And I realized, I just, I, I got to study this stuff. I got to understand the machinery. I got to understand the code. And that's really shaped most of my career. Here's the short version. If you, because cells are a universal machine, all the low-level machinery in a cell is conserved from bacteria all the way to you and me. If you can read DNA, you can pretty much understand anything biological. That's cool. And you just heard about some of the amazing progress in doing this for, for health and disease. We've also been really uh, making fast progress on being able to read this code. You've seen this slide before. It's outpacing Moore's Law. It's kind of flatlined, you know, between $100 and $1,000 over the last little while the, uh, you know, to read a full human genome. But that's a better genome fully analyzed than you could ever get at the beginning. And it's not going to stop. The number of sequences that have been produced over the last 20 years has exploded exploded because as the, the genome gets cheaper and the technology gets better to, to actually sequence, the databases just explode. There are trillions and trillions of bases in these databases now. And since inception, GenBank has doubled every 24 months, kind of like a super version of Moore's Law. Of course, this has powered a diagnostic revolution all the way down to the consumer. It's changing the way we look for cancer now because the best microscope for cancer is actually the sequence um, and, and continuing.
And of course, you just heard about the 100,000 Genomes Project. And we're, let's face it, eventually we're just going to sequence every person and every organism we can get our hands on because this technology is still advancing so quickly. It's just all this information is flooding into our data banks. We used it to track the, the COVID virus as it spread around the world and it mutated, pretty cool, in real time. And we've, we're even using it to dig up cold cases 30, 40 years ago that, that literally uh, they haven't been able to solve. Now they can run that, that DNA evidence again, look at uh, the information from you and me and from those home test kits and start to ident and really identify suspects even uh, decades later. And you can crowdsource this now. If you're interested in solving a crime, it's kind of like uh, Kickstarter for, for cold cases. And of course, we've gone to really cold cases uh, with uh, Svante uh, Pavo's work in sequencing Neanderthal and ancient genomes. You know, literally millions of years old, we can start to understand the evolution of humans. It's even coming to your local uh, home association because now you, this service will go and collect bits of dog poop and identify which dog in, the, in, your, <laughs> in your condo association has been pooping on your lawn. Kind of silly. And of course, we're learning how to interpret this information faster and faster using machine learning and other algorithms. DeepMind's work a couple of years ago to analyze every single protein was one of the holy grails uh, of bioinformatics. Absolutely amazing. But what I want to really talk to you about is flipping the coin from reading and analysis now to writing. This is where the rubber hits the road. Because if you can write DNA, you can engineer anything biological. It all works on the same machinery. Over the years, we've seen a, a number of companies and, and, uh, uh, and, and research groups advance the technology of writing DNA. These are essentially 3D printers for the DNA molecule, available as a service or a standalone unit on, on a desk. Unfortunately, they're still, uh, the, the, their capabilities are relatively limited today, but like computers and anything else digital, they're advancing over time. This makes genetic engineering easier, uh, as easy as typing in some ways. This is powering a, a number of different applications, starting with short DNA sequences to longer. Everything from protein engineering, which is a few thousand bits of code, to metabolic engineering with companies like Ginkgo that went public uh, 18 or uh, 24 months ago, uh, which is doing metabolic engineering, stringing together multiple pathways, essentially circuits, to something like the Genome Project Right, which is tr bringing together scientists to think about how how do we make these technologies cheaper so we can write the complete genome of organisms and boot them up? What type of applications can you develop with this technology? Pretty much anything that life touches. Medicines, agriculture, foods being a big one these days. Energy, biofuels, etc. even components for batteries. New materials, many cars today have, have plant-based leather instead of uh, you know, vegan leathers. Uh, to the environment, being able to degrade plastics, for example, and heal some of the damage that older technologies, chemical technologies, has really uh, put on the environment over the years. Years. The, the application space is large and growing very, very quickly. So what's near term? Well, one of the things that I've been watching over time is the cost of sequencing has been dropping and the value of the information we can get out of that sequence is growing. Here are just a few of the examples. This is basically a positive feedback loop economically. And in the next few years, I fully expect some group is gonna figure out how to take this data, amortize it over a few years and offer genomes for free for people. We're the only creatures that have economics behind our genomes, but this, it's, I've called this the Google of genomics, and, and the, we're building up a head of steam for that pretty quickly. When it comes to writing DNA, 
We're, we're, we've been kind of flatlined around 10 million bis, bits of code. That's kind of the largest genomes we've ever, the string of letters we've ever been able to assemble. But once we can break into the, the megabase range routinely at low cost or the gigabase range routinely, more and more of, the, of biology becomes programmable. Right now, we're also seeing AI tools be used to design proteins. We've reverse engineered their structure, but now they're getting creative. And this is really fascinating because imagine having an enzyme that, for example, can catalyze carbon into graphene or maybe diamond, something nature didn't do, but we may find valuable. Labs are becoming automated. I like this because now you can program the lab, send your program DNA over to it, and really be able to run experiments without having to have the complicated kitchens uh, uh, of a traditional laboratory. And this is really exciting. This has just come out in the last year. This is a company called Roswell Biotechnologies, located not too far from here. In about January of last year, they released what's called the first molecular electronic chip. And this is the actual intersection of carbon and silicon. To this chip, the first chip had 16,000 elements. You can think of them as transistors to which you can attach a single biomolecule. It could be a nucleic acid, it could be a protein, and now you get real-time sensing of that molecule and how it's engaging. Really exciting technology for sensing. And middle of last year, they also published a paper, uh, uh, part of Craig Venter's 20-year uh, summary of synthetic biology, uh, where, they, where they basically gave a sneak preview of a chip that can synthesize and assemble DNA. This is really exciting. It's like an entire lab on chip for writing DNA. And it's not just these low-level molecules. You can actually grow cells on chips. This is this a company called Cortical Labs. They started growing neurons on chips. You get real-time sensing of the neurons, and they were able to train it to have it play Pong in the same way that DeepMind, when it was founded, started training their AI systems to play games. They realized these neurons can actually be trained to play games as well. Pretty cool stuff. They called it Dish Brain. So we're in this golden age of protein engineering now, which is going to have incredible ramifications for, for human health and medicine. We're starting to do things like engineer viruses, vectors, and virus-like particles, and that's because these agents are really USB sticks for cells. It's, it's teaching us how to reprogram cells, drop in a new program, for example, to kill a cancer cell or add a new function, replace a gene. Lots of activity in this area right now. I really believe that this is going to be one of the, some of the technologies that truly allow us to advance to treat cancer in, in an individualized way and make real progress on that. In fact, uh, this foundation, uh, the Jamie Leandro Foundation, is the first group that I've come across that has built an end-to-end -end pipeline to make bespoke cancer vaccines for a patient. And I'm really excited about this pipeline that they've built because I think it'll work for other programmable medicines. And eventually, I'd love to see a computerized model of a cell very similar to Google Earth, because right now we don't have that common foundation for scientists to work on. Where does this go next? I have to be quick because there's not much time. Craig Venter in 2010 booted up the first cellular genome. He copied a genome, put in some watermarks and some quotes. When we can start to synthesize megabase DNA, it becomes basically child's play to boot up microbes. That's the biggest change in microbiology that we'll see this century. I'm already looking, can you NFT a genome and its derivatives? This could create an entirely new digital bioeconomy. We're starting to see a whole new generation, very young, come into the field. And one thing about biohackers is that they have incredible freedom to operate, self-experiment, and play. And of course, students, the iGen program has trained almost 100,000 students in this technology over the last 20 years. It's definitely going to require a bigger investment in biosecurity because we know that any system you can program will get hacked. We're also starting to see 
uh, things like de-extinction, being able to recover old genomes, boot them back up. The dodo was recently announced a couple of weeks ago, and when we get Kentucky Fried Dodo, I'm pretty sure the field of bioengineering will have tons of money. We're going after big ideas like can we stop aging or maybe make us immortal by putting our cells into tubes and keeping them stored for a thousand years and booting up a twin. And what I really like is the intersection of these technologies with space because space is going to teach us how to live in very closed systems and help us develop next generation circular systems for sustainability. I really love this stuff. And of course, we're going to turn these technologies on ourselves just like we did with IVF in the 1970s. Here you can see a sperm being injected into an egg. This is conception in IVF. It's actually, it's porn for cell biology. Where will this go? Uh, we don't know yet because we're, st we've, you know, there's only been uh, a small amount of engineering done on these embryos, most of it in research. Of course, we know the Chinese scientists booted up a few babies, spent three years in jail for doing that. The, the gene editing meeting just went on in the UK last week, and the consensus is we're just not ready for this yet, and understandably so. But I've got a couple of kids that were made in the lab. This is my daughter, Rosalind, my son, Darwin, and I can tell you, uh, he was the most advanced kid before the Chinese babies. Uh, conceived in a lab, genome was profiled pre-implantation, loves elevators and trains and is doing well. But maybe this is what our bedrooms will look like in the next 20 or 30 years where you just grow your baby beside at home. My colleague Amy Webb is brilliant at doing this type of forecasting. She just spoke at South by Southwest. Uh, this is her timeline. You can get the full report at futuretodayinstitute.com. It's a wonderful overview of bioengineering. And of course, the book will summarize a lot of this too. Don't be afraid of this technology. We're going to be smart and use it properly, but definitely, definitely invest in better biosecurity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. Quick question, we have kids about the same age. Yes. Uh, they like Legos, I'm sure. Uh, are your kids already learning SynBio, and is this gonna be the programming future, uh, a language of the future? Yes, absolutely. In fact, it's the most, it's one of the easiest programming languages to learn because it's universal. So if you can learn how to program a bacterium, you can start to think about programming something much more complex, your next pet. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right. Cheers. All right.